We are live. All right, we are live. So welcome back, everyone. This is EOS Radio number eight. We are discussing DAX, DAOs, and decentralized communities. Uh, as always, I'm joined by my co-host and brother, Zane. Hey, Zane. Hey, everybody. Happy to be here. Looking forward to today. We've got two members from EOS DAC and Miles Snyder from Aurora EOS. I know I've talked to these guys quite often, and they are very passionate folks about the, specifically the decentralization that is happening and here to talk about their project and just how they see the future happening and just what's been going on in general. So hope everybody's excited. And if they ever want to ask questions, jump in the YouTube stream live chat and we will take a look at you there and yeah. uh, get this round table going. Ash, anything you want to jump into? No, it's just, you know, this is a really interesting topic because we're seeing just, it seems like every week we have some issue with a centralized corporation. This time it was with Apple today where their FaceTime supposedly has a bug in it. And since it's not open source, people can't look into this stuff. And who knows, it might be the NSA backdoor actually coming to, to function here with the Apple iPhone and their FaceTime bug. But, you know, I, I think that I, you know, I'm really excited to have this show because I believe that decentralized communities are the future. Unfortunately, you know, we're not there yet, but these are some of the guys helping build both technically and visionarily. So I don't even know if that's a word, visionarily. Anyways, let's really get good. let's get started here. We got Luke Stokes again. Hey, welcome back, Luke. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, as you probably know, I'm Steam Witness and EOS Stack Enabler, trying to help out with building these systems. I think are to improve human well-being and create a world we all want to live in. You know. Yeah, no doubt. And also from EOS Stack, the one and only Michael Yates. Hi guys. Um, yeah, so Michael Yates, EOS Stack. I do the uh, technical side of things, block production, trying to build the contracts and uh, <clears throat> the front end for the EOS Stack toolkit which will hopefully be used by uh, quite a few other DACs. And last but definitely not least, Miles Snyder. Welcome back, Miles. Thank you. Back again. Yes, sir. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm Miles Snyder from Aurora EOS. Uh, I'm super excited to talk about this. DACs are one of my favorite subjects. Um, the, even the first time I became familiar with the concept, it radically changed the way I think about uh, certain types of blockchains. I think it's a really useful framework for, for thinking about them. And it's also just interesting as a as a new way of orga organizing human activity in a way that we couldn't do before so let's get into it yeah so let's jump in here i think uh we all have a, a bit of a debt to dan larimer who created the idea of a dac uh with bit shares luke i know you were back in those days what uh just walk, walk us through how did you learn about DACs? I, I think it's yeah it's a fascinating idea it's like a, as you kind of dive into this concept of voluntarism, which I know Dan Larimer you know, describes himself as an anarcho-capitalist and trying to make more voluntary solutions in the world. You come to this kind of revelation that most of our systems today are defined by threats of violence. I mean, that's really just what a law is. It's just like, do what we say or we're going to put you in a cage. And we have all these systems in place to try and, you know, make everybody play nice. But ultimately, you know, it, they, they don't work very well. They're not very transparent. They're very centralized. They're built on hierarchies. In order to maintain hierarchies, you generally, again, need these uh, systems of control. And so when I started kind of hearing this idea of a DAO or a DAC, I started thinking about, and I, you know, I've been programming since 96. And so I started thinking about, you know, how could software actually change the way humans interact with each other? And can we even like prevent crime and prevent all this reason for a justice and judicial system you know, prevent even that with code. And, and prior to a blockchain existing, that wasn't possible because anybody could just go find where that server is running and just shut it down. So whenever there's a central point of failure, you have uh, that, that risk, that system, systemic risk. So when, uh, you know, Dan, Dan Larimer's talking about it and uh, Vitalik has done a bunch of posts on it as well, you know, just kind of processing over the last couple of years, playing around with seeing it on BitShares, seeing it also a bit on Steam, just these ways that these, shared collaborative commons can be figured out and managed through delegated proof of stake. That was kind of my first real world, like, hey, there's these different people that are all following these software rules, but they have a connection to the real world through tokenized voting. And, and just seeing that, you know, got me all excited about, you know, eventually better systems for governance, better systems for corporations, for nonprofits, eventually for local governments, and even uh, hopefully nation state governments. And so I, I'm excited about the idea. I got kind of dragged into uh, doing EOS DAC back in April. Uh, I met Michael and uh, the rest of the team and just hearing about what they're actually building, which is essentially tools to make this super easy. So you just click a button, 
have your own deck. And the way I look at it now is I think, you know, the Silicon Valley type entrepreneur people, the VCs, they're not going to be talking about whatever centralized company they started. Instead, they're going to be talking about what community they empowered. Mm-hmm. It's all going to be about network effect. It's going to be that's, like, that's, I've launched yeah, this that's well said not what centralized company they built but what community they belong to and how and which communities they're specifically trying to create value for i, I think that's got to i mean that's so beautiful isn't it anyways um so when did you and michael meet michael what, what was your entry point into this whole dac idea um so i was looking at building software on um ethereum and um so I was interested in the decentralized aspect of it and the fact that you can have this company and this entity, which um, it needs to go on after you have stopped going on. So a lot of the problems with small companies and businesses is that, you know, it's a single man entity and what happens when that person gives up or decides they don't want to be involved in the project or dies or whatever happens. And um, it's, it's kind of like all the effort and the, the energy and the value that they've put into that business just dies with them. So I was looking for a way that I could make a system which would live longer um, so that it could change ownership quite easily and fluidly and um, still have its own control structures. Um, so, yeah, that's where I really came out. I didn't really come at it from Dan's point of view. I came at it more from Vitalik's, the unstoppable computer idea. Mm. Um, the DAO itself wasn't particularly interesting to me because it, it just sort of represented a fund, which we've seen before. And it's, you know, it didn't inter- intellectually interest me. So, um, yeah, I... I then came across Dan Larimer, I came across the EOS platform and I started looking more deeply into what he's done before and that DAC was DAO, it's just his different way of mm-hmm. wording it. Um, and yeah, ever since then, I was just talking about it a lot on the um, chat rooms as you do. And um, You're on Telegram? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I used Whoa. to be a lot. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and... Yeah, so Rob was like, why don't we build a um, blog producer? Because we were in the, all the blog producer channels, doing the, the superhero channel, all that kind of thing. And um, it just seemed like a, a difficult challenge. So I thought, sure, why not? Um, and it may cause some debates in Gov and all those kind of things. So that's a bonus. Debates we need. We appreciate <laughs> it. I believe even you had quite a few debates about the other <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, I, I did back in the day, actually. I, you know, back, back when I thought that vote buying was something to be concerned about <laughs> and now i don't uh really at all but anyways that might be another show um yeah now, what's your interest in dax and where do you fit in here so i was also i got exposed to to the idea of dax when i first encountered dan larimer's writing in 2014 um, so i became pretty involved in bit shares as well there was actually an article that dan wrote on let's talk bitcoin that um very much sort of alter my perspective because I had first gotten into to Bitcoin and I and I kind of came at it from like the Austrian economics point of view as like this is a sound money commodity. Um, but then you know I started thinking a lot about well what else could you do with blockchain technology besides just create like a digital version of gold. And that's where Dan was doing some of the most innovative research. And he had this he he wrote this article that was basically like what if instead of thinking about these as just these like public utilities, you think about them as distributed corporations and everyone who owns a token is a shareholder and those shareholders can um, elect a set of people who can run the, um, the sort of decentralized corporation on behalf of all the shareholders. And so it was this really interesting idea where it was like, okay, this is the next evolution of the company or the corporation. And instead of existing in one jurisdiction and having a CEO who's top down directives um, decide everything, you have it that's spread out all over the world. There's no single point of failure. And every decision is a result of the, you know, collective voting of all of the shareholders who are um, a part of the organization. And everything is opt-in, everything is global, everything is voluntary. And that idea was just beautiful to me. And I thought, wow, there's so much that you can do with that. And um, specifically, when when I encountered BitShares, I thought it was really interesting because it was saying, okay, this is this is a block, this is a, a distributed corporation that exists on top of a blockchain. And what it's attempting to build is a decentralized bank and exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of what BitShares was. It was this application specific DAC. Um, and then you saw something like Steam, which was a, a social media 
DAC, and then EOS came along, which which had this really interesting new value proposition, which was instead of creating an application specific chain, we're going to create an um, an operating system uh, upon which you can build any any type of application, um, whether it be the the exchange or the social network or whatever else people come up with. And I'm sure they're going to come up with lots of cool stuff in the coming years. Um, and that's kind of what led me into uh, being extremely interested in EOS and wanting to become a big part of the community. You know, you said something I wanted to segue to uh, about shares. And I've always thought the name BitShares is kind of weird back in the day. But then once I figured out it, it, it was like, these are literally your shares of this decentralized company. Yeah. Like what, what, what is what does that perspective offer? But because in Bit in Bitcoin we don't really think about that, or in Ethereum we don't think about that. This was just it's just a, a coin, or maybe you had to pay gas with it or, or something. But you didn't really, as a Bitcoiner or you know as somebody who was very early in Ethereum, I never thought that I was a shareholder of any of this. But in Dan Larimer's chains, now yeah, I'm a shareholder. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting because it it kind of goes back to the analogy of like corporate governance, which is saying by by owning a share in one of these DACs, you have a a pro rata claim on all of those resources and a pro rata claim on governance. And so when you think about not all corporations work this way, but some corporations have like shareholder governance, where if you're a shareholder, you get to vote um, on certain decisions that the company makes, whether it's like decisions about exactly what they do, what it what the company does or decisions about who gets to run the company. Um, and what that's what I think, and I, specifically about why I think DPoS is such a good model for DAC chains is that you say, okay, you are all a shareholder and collectively we have an organization and we're gonna try to maximize the value of the organization by maximizing value for the shareholders. And every shareholder gets a pro rata say in you know um, who, who gets to run the, the uh, entity and, and how the entity evolves. Mm -hmm. One of the things I think is really exciting about this is kind of as the technology is advanced, there's a great book uh, that a friend of mine recommended called Towards a Zero Marginal Cost Society. And it's essentially talking about how we have these shared collaborative commons that we're moving towards. And it's almost the evolution of capitalism to something that is a little bit different in that <clears throat> the technology is going to make it so that, you know, especially with artificial intelligence and all these other opportunities, it's going to make it so we're not really going to be able to create as much value as an individual as who once potentially could. And so we're going to have these kind of shared pools of value that we all have some shared ownership of because we're all participating in the network and the network is where the value comes from is where the story of value comes from it's the people that participate and believe that it has value that creates the value in in, in very real sense and so I, I i think about this new kind of transition towards a, these shared collaborative commons mm -hmm. and being a mechanism where we can actually have ownership of that. You know, we are our stake way to vote. We are our tokens. We can decide all voluntarily which communities we want to participate in, what that governance is going to look like, how we can even, or like Michael was saying, over time change that governance, change the system itself, actually use multi-sig transactions to modify the definition of the community we're a part of, the actual smart contracts themselves, to modify the permissions so based on, you know, like what we're doing with EOS DAC every seven days, there's a new period that will be fired off and it'll reset the permissions for those actual elected custodians. And, and there's just so many amazing things that we can do with the technology to, again, like prevent crime before it happens, prevent conflicts before they even arise. Uh, like the, the system that Michael's designed with EOS DAC, when you submit a worker proposal for the custodians to evaluate, as part of that process, you're going to actually name an arbitrator or a, an expert in that particular field of work that you're going to be doing to add value to the community. And that'll be part of the evaluation criteria for the custodians. And if they know that person, they have a reputation, they're trusted, then they accept that proposal. And then if down the road, they're like, hey, I don't think you did the work. We don't want to pay you. Or maybe a new custodian board comes in and they're hostile and they're like, nah, we don't want to pay you. What's amazing about this technology is the money has already been put in a custodian account or in a uh, uh, an account that's that's an escrow account with a two or three multi-sig. So if the custodians disagree, you have that arbitrator and the worker, they can actually override, do a two or three and make sure that they get paid. So, and, and vice versa, if somebody's like trying to scam the DAC and not do the work, they are, you know, the arbitrator with the reputation on the line can say, hey, you know what? I agree with the custodians, this work was not done and they're not willing to do what's necessary. So we can refund the money back to the DAC. So these are all the things that in a traditional system, it's like, a crime happened, let's call the guys with guns to like break down a door and you know shoot the dog, right? right. <laughs> Instead, yeah. it's like we're preventing the crime from even being technically possible mm. within this ecosystem of uh, smart contract control and, and well-defined transparent permissions. So it's, it's just a whole new paradigm 
for how humans are going to interact. And, and again, it's all voluntary and it's beautiful. One of the things it's all I voluntary think, and it's all open and transparent and verifiable, yes. which I think is it's super cool. So I so we're all like DAX fanboys on this call. I think that's pretty obvious. So <laughs> what I think might be fun, we're some pretty smart people. Let's try to like disprove ourselves, right? Like sure. I got like I was saying, I got earlier I was saying I got trolled a little bit on Twitter today. Being like, ah, this is a joke, you know. What, what, what a pointless waste of time you guys have been trying to build this thing. And I'd love to talk through like with some really smart people who love DAX, like what are the, what are the things that keep us up at night? What are the, what are the ways that we think we're, this is totally going to fail and is a waste of, you know, years of our lives trying to do this all? Wouldn't well, that be a maybe, fun conversation? Yeah, maybe not totally going to fail, but just some, some areas that I think centralization is better um, mm-hmm. just for efficiency. You know, I see uh, just for decision making in general, you know, the, exactly. the the idea of like, do we want the entire community, which would be the largest DAC in EOS mainnet? Do we want the entire community to vote on stuff or, or do we, are we comfortable with elected representatives of some sort making decisions on our behalf? Like, you know, I run my business and I'm the benevolent dictator because I'm the, the sole owner of my business and I make a lot of decisions. Some of them are bad, but the majority of them, I think have turned out very, very wise. And, but if I brought everything up for a vote for my whole staff, I did actually at one point, I I wanted to see if my staff thought it would be good to have a two hour virtual assistant service. And they were like, no, 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 no. And I overwrite and I said, yes. And now it's one of our most popular products. So I think the inefficiency associated with decentralized organizations and just decision making. I think when we first started EOS DAC, that was one of the first things we thought about was the, the, overarching control structure whether it was going to be completely community decided or whether we were going to have these custodians and i think it was a bit of a no-brainer really to to put the custodians in there just because the worst thing that could happen to a dag in my opinion is it just does nothing it Mm. can't make any decisions it can't move forward it's got a split three-way custodian pool and they just cannot come to a decision on anything and it just just grinds to a halt eventually or it kind of spirals down the price and then people buy it over and take it over to, mm-hmm. to do what they choose. To, um, and then it just becomes centralized. So it, it's, the, it's the, probably the, the biggest problem that we face is that how do we come to a decision? Um, and people are quite afraid of making bad decisions, which I think is why BitShares had a lot of problems with the work proposals. Mm-hmm. They're more, more afraid of losing money than they are of uh, making money. Yeah. Or, or just like um, putting the, their reputation on the line by making, by, by holding a position. You know, you, yeah. We're seeing yeah, this yeah. in EOS <clears throat> right now. People are just abstaining from voting. Yeah. And I'd rather make, you know, one bad decision and nine good decisions than, than make no decision at all. No doubt. Um, so that's, I think what we're going to probably tweak with. So there's a lot of parameters we could tweak with on our DAC. I think the, the DAC itself is good as a structure, but we have to look at things like voting for the governance. We have to look at how big a token holder pool do we have? Is it just a very localized? It could be two or three people in a DAC um, going all the way up to what we've done, which is the entire EOS community. Um, so yeah, we're, we're gonna tweak these parameters. We're gonna have a look at different ways of voting, um, whether it's first past the post or whether it's um, um what we have now which is five choices of 12. Mm. um there's a lot of experimentation we can do which is why i don't think it's necessarily going to fall on its face but our first attempt may well fail it's one it's, would expect <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is what you would expect for a first time try of something in um, a brand new technology <clears throat> yeah exactly I think- which is moving as we're even working on it you know it, it's consistently changing as uh yeah the, the how, about you, how about you look luke what, what do you think is a weak point i i think well like especially early on one of my biggest concerns was that nobody would care like and no one would use it they'd be like why did i do that it's too hard like for example when we actually this particular incarnation of a deck we were very uh careful to do everything completely above board and legal according to every jurisdiction we could get advice from you know, we have lawyers in Anguilla, we have lawyers in Zug, Switzerland, we have, you know, and, and we have, for example, worker contracts are actually handled by a separate entity that is a centralized organization that will do traditional payroll concerns and keep, you know, taxes and all that craziness, you know, because we recognize that if, if this model can't exist completely above board and 
you know, be funded well to create all the tooling that all these other DACs need, then, then the system might even be dead before it even starts. So it's just like, it's really difficult to set up a DAC in that way where you have, you know, everything completely legal, everything completely open. Uh, and, and so it was kind of this concern of like, man, it's so hard to do. Maybe nobody will do it. But what I've been encouraged by over the last, you know, month or two, I have some friends like uh, Beehives Collective. They're doing some really cool stuff in Utah, Travis, where he's got the Utah government on board and, and he's hyping up this thing he's doing. They've got a big town hall meeting coming up next month. And it, it's just so cool to see how excited he is about it. Cause he's like, holy moly, I'm getting all this real money investment interest. And he's like, without this DAC structure that you guys have built, I would, it wouldn't be possible. I'd be freaking out about how to, how we can actually protect these funds. And now he's looking at it and he's not going to be touching fiat at all. It's completely crypto directly, even with the, the uh, local Utah people that, you know, he's looking at this going, this is the savior. This is what we needed. You know? So I get a little encouraged to say, okay, okay. People actually, all this work is going to be worth it. People understand the need for this. But I, I think the other kind of, as we mentioned is, you know, the, the decentralized nature of this might be so foreign to some people that they're just like, well, why don't I just go to my local government office and file for an LLC? Like, wh why, why don't I just do the normal corporate thing? And maybe, you know, one of the biggest uh, challenges we might have is that we don't understand the need for LLCs and what value they bring and why they've been so helpful for so long. And we may not learn from the mistakes of the past, create this new entity, and then all of a sudden it's all like joint and civil liability and we're all, you know, we, we get people getting getting in legal trouble just because of the structure that we create. Uh, and these are the challenges we gotta, we gotta work out and figure out. But ultimately I think that the trade-off of transparency, reproducibility, and you know, clearly understanding who's making what decisions and how the money is flowing, I think is hugely valuable. Well, what do you think this means for traditional legacy governments as we know it? I, well, I'd love to think that it puts them on their back. Starting the revolution early, right? <laughs> <clears throat> I, I think it's gonna start, I, I think it's gonna start local. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I think it's going to start local. Like, like I've had some cool. great conversations here in, in Puerto Rico, uh, like with some people working on nonprofits and stuff. And, and they, for example, this is, is a call I had a couple weeks ago that was fascinating. There was a whole group of people working on a nonprofit situation for years, and the government was secretly kind of like getting rid of all these documents that proved ownership to these communities of these, these protected lands. And there was like one person that happened to find a document, like way buried away, that proved, no, this is really our land. And the government was like, you know, trying oh, to make all these copies go away, right? <laughs> like, I got I mean, it. Those are the kind of things you could put that on a blockchain. You can have mechanisms for ownership and governance that are documented immutably forever. And it creates a situation where that kind of centralized authoritarian move is just not even possible anymore. And you get a community of people together that say, no, no, look, this is the truth. This is verifiable. This is fact. And from that standpoint, you know, they have to play ball. The way I look at it is, you know, they're a service provider. If they can't provide better services than a group of passionate community members that are voluntarily engaged, yeah. they're going to be threatened. Yeah, they are a service provider. And the main service that they provide is consensus, I guess. At least that's what they sell. Government tries to offer consensus to a community. But what happens when we don't need their consensus mechanism anymore? This is the thing that really excites me is we now have free market voluntary competition for reaching consensus as us as a society. I mean, uh, th th this to me is the, the absolute revolutionary, most fundamental aspect of DAX is that, yeah, we're, de we're a decentralized community and we haven't really been able to reach consensus on any type of level at this point, unless we all like go to the same church or something. But now we can do this on a global level. I, I don't know, Zane, you you're quiet over there. What, what, how do you feel about the ability for decentralized communities to reach consensus and what that means, you know, for the future. Well, that was one of the most exciting parts that even attracted me to just voting in general with tokens. I mean, proof of stake was interesting in that regard, but then delegated proof of stake with EOS specifically is what got me more excited. Uh, just knowing that it only takes a group of people agreeing to use a certain system and just to, to agree on those rules is all, all it takes. Hmm. I mean, now having tools that like folks like US DAC are making <clears throat> and promoting, get actually providing us tools that we can use to, you know, to structure things way more than we've been able to in the past. So just knowing that it only has to start small. And then once you bring your friend in, you bring your friend in before you know it, more and more people can actually enjoy this new type of technology. And when you look back and compare it to the weights we had to agree before, like you said, you're looking at old records from a dusty book. Like, like we can, we can just, everyone can go themselves and have the full record. So it's just, just really brings, brings new possibilities out. And I'm kind of looking forward to on the voting front, um, 
just d- different ways of seeing community voting. Uh, I don't even know, maybe even like homeowners, who even knows what structure people can implement this stuff into. It's like, instead of having, <laughs> pretty much in any way that you're currently structured, you could probably involve some of these tools that EOS Stack is building, or even even implement the ideas that they're talking about and bring it into the world and just, just make things more smooth, more transparent, more, more reliable and easier for everybody involved. Yeah, let's talk about some of those tools. Michael, what are you building? Um, so we've just finished with the member client, which is our interface to our DAC. So the first challenge was to actually build a DAC ourselves, to make ourselves a DAC. Um, and the next one is that we're going to try to make these tools available to other people who want to run DACs as well, obviously. Um, so it's a bit difficult because we're, we're barely running them on, on them ourselves. So the plan is that we would deploy contracts and then anybody could come to those contracts and sort of host their DAC within that um, rather than having to take our contracts, deploy them themselves, work out how to configure them and then set up the member clients. So it, we're aiming to make, a, I think we called it a factory or something, DAC factory, is it? Um, yeah. <clears throat> which would enable someone to just come and point and click and say, this is my account please set me up the whole DAC structure because it's about, it's getting onto seven or eight different accounts now with various different code installed depending on what kind of options you need. To set up um, the DAC framework itself. Yeah. yeah. So like yeah. to get an overview, you've got, you know, you've got an account, for example, that just does the tokens and the membership, you know, so that tracks whether or not you've actually registered as a member and you've read and signed the constitution, which is another important aspect of this as part of this voluntary situation, we actually have participants who've read the constitution and actually agree beforehand. It's not like, you know, after the fact, hey, well, you're using it, you know, so therefore you must have agreed to this, you know, pseudo constitution thing. It's actually verified on chain, like, no, at this timestamp, at this block number, they agreed. And then from there, you've got the uh, custodian voting system. So that includes pay for custodians, that includes the vote tallying every seven days, that includes uh, paying out worker proposals, and includes modifying the permissions on those custodians. And then the part we're still working on is the worker proposal system as well, where members of the DAC can submit worker proposals to provide value to the community, and then the custodians will vote, and, and those will get paid out. So those are kind of the three major pieces. But it, with that, too, you've got, like I mentioned, escrow accounts, uh, DAC authority permission account, where all the permissions roll up into uh, a lot of different pieces that make this all work. Multi-signature uh, systems where you can uh, you know, easily handle multi-sig within the DAC, a lot of stuff like that. I can't help so, but, but f- oh, so go ahead, Miles, go ahead. Well, no, I was just going to say, I think it's really cool that what the EOS DAC guys are doing, because you guys are building all this infrastructure for, for I think, taking DACs to kind of the next level, because I actually think of EOS itself as a DAC, and the um, the block producers are like the hired workers, right? And the, when when I first got involved in BitShares, there was actually, the, the original idea was to have 100 witnesses who were like the, the workers. And because running a node on BitShares, like running a block producing node, it wasn't, the, it wasn't the same as running something on EOS where there's a lot more requirements. It was something that, that most people, you know, reasonably technical could do. So the idea was that everyone who wanted to be a worker for the DAC would also be a block producer and they'd run a node and you had people who were campaigning as just like, you know, I'm gonna do marketing for the DAC. And be, you know, being a VP was the way that they, they were able to take on that role. Now, I think as we as we move into other types of, of DACs, you're going to want to be able to have a DAC that hires workers that doesn't require them to also be consensus operators, right? And that's what I see a lot of them doing. So being able to have a DAC treasury and being able to vote on payouts and have people who are employed by the DAC and all that, like that's really important. Um, and I think, you know, uh, I'm super glad that these guys are building it. I would just want to say, Miles, to you know, echo that. I can't help but draw parallels to what Dan was thinking while building Steemit, thinking like, oh, there's a common tool set that I need. Like every time I built BitShares and built Steemit, like there, there's just, there's stuff I need, right? So he's like, all right, fine. I'll just build EOS and I'll build all this, all this plumbing into EOS so, so I, can, I can more easily build in the future. It sounds like that's kind of what you guys are doing. You're doing the plumbing and the, and the framework right now so that you might be able to, to build, quickly spin up a DAC in the future. Yeah, I mean, I, I had a situation just last week where I, I realized the value of what we've been building. I, I was flying out to Denver on Sunday, and I don't normally work on planes, but I just started like packing out a document. It was about eight pages by the time I landed in Denver about how the Steam community could potentially use the EOS DAC tools to yeah. solve a ridiculous number of 
you know, issues we've seen with centralized control and lack of transparent governance within the ecosystem. We have the block producers and that's all great, but essentially this, this large stake in, in Steam Incorporated and the way it was being used has been a continual source of frustration for the wider community. And I was just sitting there thinking, oh my goodness, like everything we've just built, you could pretty easily, like I just laid it all out there saying, if anybody wanted to do this, they could start it right now. They could take our smart contracts and, and set this up right now. And it, it would work. And it's funny because there's there's a, a lot of community initiatives lately the last few weeks uh, about trying to get like a Steam Alliance and these other things. And it's funny as I watch them, they're, they're essentially reinventing a lot of stuff we already built with EOS DAC. Mm -hmm. Like their people are submitting kind of pseudo profiles within Discord, you know, describing who they are. And mm -hmm. it's just not very transparent. It's difficult to go find again. And I'm like, that's well, kind of cool that our profiles are all on chain and you can verify them yourself. And, right. you know, they, 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 so it's, it's just, it's interesting. It, it encourages me that what we're building, I think will be useful because I've seen a number of communities that don't have that level of transparent uh, decision-making distributed across a lot of token holders, a lot of shareholders. And now that I, I, I see this, these problems and I've lived in on steam for a couple of years, BitShares as well, you know, seeing I, my friend Bill Butler did a bunch of the, front end improvements. And, and he was telling me stories of how long it took him to try to get those committee members to agree to some of these payments yeah. to improve the BitShares UI and UX, which just, you know, desperately needed it. Yeah. And so I'm thinking, okay, yeah, some of these, some of these things we're iterating on and improving. And like Michael said, it's all an experiment. We may fail and, and just keep making it better as we go forward. But that's the fun part about what we're doing is that we can, we can modify it. You know, EOS allows us to modify the code and improve the code and uh, try new systems. So, so zoom out for me, guys. What, what does this mean to you to be the guys, the team pushing this technology forward? I mean, you, there's not many people working on this stuff in the world and you are working on it possibly more than anyone else. Well, what does this just mean for you personally and like philosophically? You want to go first, Michael? Mm. Um, I mean, everything moves so quickly everything is just such a blur you don't really take that time to kind of stop and think you're just doing what you want to do which i think is the most fun thing it's just like i get to choose what i'm working on and i can have people supporting me on that and it's it's great so yeah obviously <laughs> it could go either way you know if it fails horribly it's going to be terrible but if it goes really well then it, it's going to be great and we'll also we'll all celebrate somewhere um but yeah, it's, it's, it's just such a busy time and so hectic that I don't really think too you much You tend to sit down into the weeds. <laughs> well, my ideas are these big ideas anyway. So I'm kind of, I, you know, I, I like to have the, the, the un, unachievable ideas. So You definitely um, have a lot of ideas. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, well, 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 I hope you find some time to swallow some helium and, and come up for air a little bit. Yeah, because I, I think it's yeah. I think it's a really big I think you know you guys are on the precipice of a, a an executable revolution and in freedom and free societies. I think it's a, it's going to be a long journey as well. Just this tech yeah. bit and everything and the the legal stuff is just the beginning of it. We want to make it so that uh, governments recognize uh, the DEX as a as an entity itself and if they don't they can get bent <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and um you know governments there's, there's a lot of a lot of people like Lieberland who potentially could be running a DAC structure which i'm really interested in looking at um and yeah i, I just imagine it's gonna spiral out of control and um let's hope for the best yeah in, in the very best ways right i think i think for well, me yeah one of the one of the neatest things for me is just for so many years being you know a little frustrated with the federal reserve system and the, the <laughs> government system and everything that i've i've come to uh, learn about how it actually functions and how again there's just a lot of cronyism and control and really threats of violence kind of by uh you know a group of arguably sociopathic uh, people so i was kind of thinking like you know, a lot of people would, would hear me, you know, writing essays or doing videos and stuff. And they'd be like, well, what are you actually doing? What are you, how, what are you actually building to make right. a difference? Right. Like, and, and I, at the time I'd be like, well, you know, I'm educating people about cryptocurrency, teaching them about Bitcoin and teaching them how that, you know, owning your own store of value is this really important thing towards a, you know, a future where you have freedom and liberty. But I feel like for me personally, being part of the stack, whether or not it becomes some massive success or not, is really valuable to me because I feel like, okay, I'm actually doing something, you know, it, it's not just 
complaining about the problems. It's like Buckmaster Fuller, you know, you, you have to reinvent something brand new if you want to change the system. You, know, you can't change it from inside. It's just, you're just going to beat yourself against a wall. You have to build something 10 times better that everybody just goes, well, obviously we're going to use that now. And then just, it'll be the new thing. And people would just transition to it without even thinking about it. And I think that that participating in something like that on such a grand scale uh, is really fulfilling for me personally, because I feel like, okay, now I'm not just complaining. I'm actually bringing the solution potentially. And we'll see if it works. If it doesn't, at least I helped educate the space a little bit more on possibility, get people to think outside of the box a little bit more and to recognize that, you know, when it comes to consensus, there are other mechanisms than just whoever's got a costume and a badge and a gun, you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it is called human action and not human reading or human complaining. So I, I feel you there. Uh, Miles, what does it mean for you? I mean, wh where do you see this building freedom? Yeah. I mean, so I'm not like these guys, you know, I'm not, uh, out there building the the tools to enable all the DAX of the future, but it's it's something I pay very close attention to, and I think, you know, within within the crypto space as a whole, um, I'm interest. I, I've I've been very interested in a lot of the ideas that I think are like on the bleeding edge of almost what's possible. So like two of the areas I'm most interested in are like decentralized stable coins and just uh, DAX or DAOs. Uh, because these are ideas that a lot of people just dismiss. They say, oh, that's, you know, we're never going to, we're never going to figure it out. But in my opinion, it's like, we we're still so early. And if we do, those are the things that feel like they'll be game changers. Um, and so I think that there's just so much potential there and so much interesting stuff happening. And, um, you know, I think being part of the EOS community is cool because you, you really are at the forefront globally of what's happening in uh, the DAX space, you know, there's other, um, you know, the Aragon people within the Ethereum community are doing some cool work. Um, Decred arguably is, is operating in a, in a DAC or DAO like fashion fashion. So that's not to say there, there aren't other, um, you know, chains and communities doing interesting things, but I think, um, you know, without a doubt, the legacy of BitShares and then steam and now, um, EOS has, has created the most like forward thinking and innovative, um, community out there with regards to to DAX and DAOs and how that's going to look in the future. So I'm really glad you mentioned some of the existing systems out there because that's something I've been thinking a lot about in terms of you know one, I was just refreshing the EOS white paper today and it talks about inter blockchain communication and you know Boss Network just just actually did it you know a couple times you know as they're playing around with their innovations and so I get really excited about these different communities coming together and actually working together to move the entire space forward and I, I hope for a future where all of these different chains will start talking to each other and you can have cross-pollination of governance models. You could even have tokens from one chain. And this is actually what I was exploring with Steam. It's the idea that you could take your Steam power, your, your, your staked Steam, have a way to record it on the EOS blockchain in a provable way with your cryptographic signature, and then do your governance in these tools in whatever you know blockchain enables that currently EOS, but whatever it might be in the future. Even a DAG, I mean, I, I'm just, I'm not like a maximalist when it comes to you know, improving human well-being. So ultimately, whatever tool does it, but have these communities start working together. Like, I don't want to reinvent what Aragon and these other communities have already invented. I hopefully want to create a situation where we can all start working together because I think that will be where we get that network effect where more and more people are involved. They're more, they have skin in the game and they feel like it's theirs, not just some other person's thing. Yeah, and I think that like the EOS community has certain ways of, of thinking about things and there are like, um, you know, I think there's certain thoughts around like the, the right trade-offs in the space and scalability versus security, decentralization and all these things that a lot of people in the EOS community have similar views on. Um, but there are a lot of really cool ideas happening elsewhere. And like, I think there's a ton to learn from, from other ways of looking at things. And, you know, some of those th things I've seen coming out of like Aragon and how they're thinking about the future of, of um, you know, other ways that, that voting could be done and anonymous voting and, you know, using zero knowledge proofs and, you know, super, super cutting edge stuff that I haven't, I certainly haven't thought about. And so, um, you know, I was even thinking about trying to go to their, um, their Aracon convention. I couldn't end up going because of um, just like travel complications, but, um, but yeah, I would love to interface more with the other communities that are doing interesting stuff in the space because I think there's a ton to learn. Yeah, Aragon was one that really caught my attention back in, I think, early 2017 or so, because just mm -hmm. the whole concept of decentralized communities and mm -hmm. and finding some level of, I'm not going to say authority, but just some level of being able to ha let people feel heard and reach consensus on, on stuff. I and they actually had a product out, which, you know. I was going to say they had something tangible, which was. Yeah, uh, they were. Yeah, 
one of the first <laughs> Ethereum projects that actually had something. So I was like, oh, it was it was one of our key motivators to begin with. It was we want this kind of point and click interface, which anyone can use to run this stack because. The contracts are one thing. The contracts live on the chain they're, they're themselves. They have to be tight and solid, and that's where everything is done. But real people need to use a user interface, not Cleos. And um, I think that's one of our one of our challenges that we're, we're trying to make it so that anyone can do a multi-sig and anyone can uh, propose these changes to the DAC. Whereas, to be fair, it's probably just me, possibly Luke, who could actually even run this thing at the moment. Yeah, probably. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it. It's complicated. So. Oh, I'm sure it is. It it always starts complicated, and hopefully, you know, good <clears throat> designers, including programmers, there make it make it simple. Uh, yeah. Do you guys have any? Can you give us some inside information here? Do you have any expectations of uh, some sort of interface or GUI release? We already have the GUI for our member client, which is being used now. Um, in terms of something which is going to build DAX, there's nothing um, nothing secret. To be fair, there's nothing secret in the DAC at all. It's it's very hard to keep secrets in a in a DAC because uh, you have to whisper to to people in Telegram, and um, it doesn't work in the end. You're not good at whispering, anyways. Yeah, and once we have twelve custodians, you all have to be aware of it, and then it has to be on chain, and it has to be voted for budget. Then you're going to know what projects we're working on before we've even started working on them. So, so I think you guys are looking still for 15% voting. I think maybe you took that from the uh, EOS mainnet launch. How's that going? Yeah, I was, I was just going to say perfect segue into our little like pitch here, members.eosdac.io. Uh, yeah, we're actually, last I checked, I think it was yesterday, we were like 13.67% or something like that. And so we're trying to reach 15% of the whole, of all the EOSDAC token holders uh, participating in the governance by signing up as a member and voting for a custodian. And so again, that's really easy to do if you've got scatter set up and you've got EOSDAC tokens, you can do it very, very simply, members.eosdac.io. Um, you know, we, the Genesis custodians have been kind of putting themselves on the line this whole time, according to the constitution prior to this launch of handing over the, the ownership of the DAC to these elected custodians. So it's kind of getting to the wire where we're kind of going, okay, you know, how much longer are we going to wait for this to happen? We've got some ideas, you know, we could modify the constitution and, you know, bump it down a couple percentage points and launch and just not worry about it. We could just set a date, which is what something we're considering just saying, Hey, you know, as of this date, it's just going to be live. Uh, and I think even Michael had some, some creative ideas where you could actually uh, mint some tokens, vote, and then burn the tokens. And it would be like, you wouldn't have to modify the constitution. According to the constitution, creating new tokens is something that the uh, Genesis custodians and the actual elected custodians could technically do. As as I think we've done very well to get to 13.5%. Um, oh, for sure. Considering we're, yeah. just, we're just a small company, we're not a chain like EOS. We don't yeah. have um, exchanges to come in and unlock us you know, immediately. So. We just need um, to get I'm money back, happy. Miles. There to start voting. <laughs> yeah, please, Miles. I know you got to you got to take your private key from cold storage, but it's worth it. yeah, I've got to I got to make a trip to the uh, the mountains in Switzerland where I where I keep exactly. it. Oh, that's just a joke. They're the mountains of Colorado. Come on, Miles. <laughs> Luke visited us last week. You can visit us next week. And Michael, you're whenever you got to go across the pond. But anyways, yeah, I digress. Ash, I have a question for the group. I, I'm curious what you guys think about best practices for, for actually launching a DAC. Because one of the interesting challenges is that, like you were, Luke, you were saying, you know, people aren't going to be talking about the centralized company that they started. They're going to be talking about the, you know, the communities that they contributed to. But what if, you know, if you're a person who has an idea for an interesting DAC, how do you go about doing that without retaining centralized control and actually achieving decentralization, even though that's a nebulous concept and it obviously exists along a spectrum, but, but what do you guys think about like for people who have ideas about new communities that can form, you know, how do you go about doing that? I've actually thought about this quite a bit in terms of like, as an entrepreneur, I've, you know, done businesses and stuff. And I've thought about if I was to start a new business, I would probably start it as a DAC, even if I was the only person. And, and, and I would, it sounds silly, but as I started thinking about it, I'm like, it's kind of cool because my current understanding of value is that it's just shared delusions. It's shared storytelling. If we believe yep. that it has value and other people come along and believe it too, then all of a sudden there's real value and people do work for that value. So I was kind of thinking like, what if I started 
submitting worker proposals to myself and I was the only custodian and I started mm -hmm. demonstrating on chain the value for what I created for this business I built. So for example, yeah. I could say, yeah, I'm going to do, you know, hundred dollars an hour worth of work for the next two weeks. And I'm going to build X and maybe nobody even cares what I'm doing, but it's all just me goofing around. But ultimately once that story is created all provable on chain and people start to see that the work that I do is there, someone else might come along and say, you know, I want to participate. How, how can I, how can I help? Well, submit a worker proposal. And then you could have it set up that maybe I'm the only custodian because I'm the only one that has tokens and this idea mm -hmm. I invented in my head, uh, you know, eventually I would vote in someone else to start getting paid in the tokens. And then all of a sudden someone else comes along and says, wow, well, I can't contribute, you know, programming or marketing or translation or any of these other things, but I want to support what you're doing because I, I need it for my business, this thing you're trying to build. So how about I buy up some of the tokens and now they're a participant in the governance model. And so you can really build something like this really organically. And I think the, the number one problem I've seen in so many different token projects is the lack of uh, good distribution, right? Especially yep. when there's governance involved. So when you have, and this is a, a, a number one problem with steam that we've seen for years, you know, they had 80% of the tokens and they were, you know, selling them into the market today. They got about 20%. And there's, there's other projects that, uh, you know, have no development They're like Doge or whatever that have done really well in the marketplace. Whereas steam is it, it created app base and resource credits and all these incredible things, but that selling pressure has really, you know, frustrated the community. So there's things like that where, and even there's after that experience, I'm kind of sitting there going, okay, well, what is, what is block one going to do with those hundred million tokens, you know, and, and just this concept of the, the, the centralization of token holdership can actually become a problem with these beautiful decentralized technological models. So I, I think there are a number of ways within the spectrum that that can go. And I think that if somebody creates a good story, part of that story has to be the token distribution. So if I was to create something where it's just me and I start bringing in buddies and other people that want to help, if I have too much control because I'm a greedy SOB, then like my story is going to suck, you know? And that's really what it comes down to. It's like, if, but if I create something where it's like, I could demonstrate, I really did create this much value. And everyone's like, yeah, we agree. You created that much value. So it wouldn't be weird that I would have that much influence, that much skin in the game on the deck itself. So I think that ultimately the answer to that question, I, I think is uh, dependent on the individual communities and the shared story of value telling that they already have collectively. And then how do they go forward in a way they, that they agree to as far as the distribution goes? I, you know, uh, we've talked about this, Ash, about whether or not the EOS DAC model was the right way to go. You know, they did the full token drop kind of as I was showing up. So I didn't have a whole lot of say in how that went. But as, you know, as we see, some people got tokens that maybe don't care about DAX at all. And maybe that wasn't the best way to get a really committed community that are passionate about DAX. But that's also an argument for why it was interesting that it was done way back in April, the airdrop. Because now people that didn't care just sold that off. And now hopefully we have a more centralization of, uh, you know, community members that care and they have skin in the game for what DAX are all about and DAC enablers. But, you know, we'll see. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Like one of the interesting things about the way that Block One went about doing the ICO was that um, it was actually, I think, a, a good, a great distribution method to get a, a wide distribution, allow for price discovery over the course of the year, allow people to buy and sell out depending on how things went. And I think as a result, you've got, you know, as Ash said, the mainnet is like the biggest, the way to define the overall EOS community is, is token holders on the mainnet and that's pretty distributed. So one way to sort of bootstrap your DAC and and get a wide distribution is to just airdrop to, to all the existing token holders. However, like you said, you may run into problems around apathy or token holders that don't necessarily want to participate in your, um, in your project and that could affect your um, efficiency on, on the other end. Um, but there may be interesting models somewhere in between where you could, for example, airdrop to everyone who has actively voted for 21 or more block producers. And then you're targeting a, a subset of the, of the existing super wide distribution, but you're specifically targeting for the types of individuals that you would like to be a part of your community. And that's just one example, but I think there's probably a lot of different ways that you could do it. Hmm. I'd, I'd go to say that the, number one thing you should have before you start a DAC is the vision or the goal of what you want that DAC to achieve because at some point it's going to be questioned um, <laughs> so what you think you're starting you have to make sure that it's very clear we've done it with uh, EOS DAC you know even Luke there's got the DAC enabler that's our our motto like block production and DAC enablement and that kind of keeps the tempo for everybody within the DAC to know what decisions to make. Um, and then, um, so you were saying about apathy as well. And I think actually 
a certain amount of apathy isn't necessarily a bad thing. I think if you have a far too focused um, general pool of people who are not contributing value necessarily, um, i.e. people who buy the token, um, then you end up with whales who have too much share of your system. So to kind of dilute the whales out, you need these apathetic token holders who really only care about increasing the value of their token, which is your job as the custodians. And then you've got the smaller part of the community who cares enough to vote. Um, and then you've obviously got the custodians who are the, the most dedicated and the workers who are adding the value every day. So, um, yeah, a lot of people talk about like the, um, the airdrop method or the, the air grab method, whereby your, your token holders will elect to receive the tokens from you, which kind of indicates, yeah, we're going to have a much more engaged community, but you may actually end up with a much more poorly distributed community. Mm -hmm. who over time just grow their their power and their share within i mean you see it in steam it you know they take a small share and they they can use that and exploit it to to gain more and more of the pie so i guess along those lines oh are you finished guy no i was just gonna sum up and say yeah it's all still experimentation with how how these distributions work our eos DAC distribution is actually not very similar to eos anymore um, it's it's kind of merged and it's now 50-50. I think 50% of our EOS DAC token holders have EOS as well. Yeah, I was going to ask somebody in our, somebody watching on YouTube, Justin Buck asked, if EOS DAC could redo their token distribution, would they? And just along, along those lines, I guess what mechanisms would you use or how could you even decide among the current community? I'm just curious as to how that dynamic would work since everything's really up for deciding now. And it's really up to the community members. How would you yeah, even go about? I don't about know if I, I don't know if I would change it at all because this is that experiment of that kind of an airdrop of a, um, mm -hmm. a global airdrop, which I think is important for the the kind of system level services, which is what I see EOS DAC as. It's much more like a chain property rather than um, a private property, so it needs to be distributed widely. Um, I, I don't think I would change it, to be honest. Um, there are many options and we'll get to try those later, but for now, let's see what this one does. Did you see much uh, negative impact on people who just got free tokens and sold them? Uh, I mean, I know the entire, the entire um, market has sold off, but. That, that creates a market because obviously you should have an equivalent number of people who are excited about the project and want to buy into it. So um, it, cre it creates buying and selling, which I think is, is good because it's kind of naturally readjusting itself by people who believe in you. Miss that yeah, too. and I think even if you have like an, an initial sell-off and the price goes down as a, as a result, you know, every, every seller has a buyer and the people who are buying in, you know, are buying in because even at a lower price, they see value there. And, you know, ideally, they're people who are more incentivized to actually participate um, and more informed about what's actually going on there. Mm -hmm. I, I was actually surprised to see early on the price go as high as it did. It was kind of crazy. There was a period of time we're looking around. It was going, really what, crazy. What the, yeah, like what <laughs> yeah. the heck is going on? I mean, we were one of the first real yeah. airdrops on the EOS token. Actually, first airdrop on EOS in April, and then the first like created token actually on the EOS mainnet. Uh, other than like some, what was that other token? It was like AD. I think it was ADD. Yeah, yeah, something like that. So we were one of the real you know pioneers in this space. You know, uh, and that's that's thanks to Michael and Rob and, and our technical team. But it's, it's, I've thought about this a lot and shout out to Justin. He's been great. He's, been, he's been involved in a lot of our discussions and it's been fun to bounce some of the, bouncing some of these ideas off of him. Like I said, I came a little bit late. I wasn't like the original group of guys that started this. Um, but I think if I was to change anything, maybe it would probably be around like how the initial tokens were even figured out. Like when they were just worthless, right? There were all these tokens and, and the, the Genesis custodians who kind of started this thing you know, we're just kind of giving it out to people to make sure that it could become a reality. And there wasn't a lot of transparency or, or uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of visibility on that. And some of that was probably for legal protection reasons and trying to avoid being a security and this, that, and the other. I mean, it's just a worthless token given to people with no expectation of return and, and anything else. But I think later it kind of created a, con a concern because people were used to like the ICO model where it's like, oh, X percentage is going to go to this group of people and X percentage is going to, and everybody has this, you know, 
expectation that is created that they can follow along with. And I don't think EOS DAC, the token distribution really had that. So there was kind of this expectation that, you know, there was going to, that something was supposed to happen now that, you know, all these people got, gave, gave all these tokens out. Um, but it, it was just kind of a learning curve for everyone. But I agree with Michael in that this experiment had to happen. And I think others have maybe tried to replicate the experiment later and kind of decided, well, you know, maybe, maybe it doesn't work as well. Like you said, people have done air grabs and then they find out that very few people actually go and grab the token. Right. So, so I, I appreciate the, the experiment happening when it did also just the, in the timeline of, of the, the, the law year long ICO, because it kind of created a unique opportunity as well as EOS was kind of figuring itself out. Um, but I, again, I'd love to see this technology get launched and then to see all kinds of new models going forward. And also to potentially see cross chain airdrops, you know, this idea that you could have a DAC that exists on, you know, boss and warbly and, you know, Talos and who knows what, and you could have mechanisms where these, you know, if you're participating in governance on multiple chains, just like you were talking about, Miles, you know, if you vote for 21 block producers, what if you're involved in multiple EOSIO chains, that might be a, a, an incentive for a, more of an airdrop as an example. What are some of the types of communities that you feel are the lowest hanging fruit to use DAC technology? I, I think for me personally is nonprofits. I get really excited about the you know, reporting needs that nonprofits have. They already have to have everything transparent. They already have to have documentation uh, and, and, they are, and they need governance. They, they have to they get these funds that they're responsible for and they have to figure out a way to transparently distribute those funds to meaningful and valuable things. So I look at, I look at DAX as a perfect way to do that right away. And, and I see it as a really cool thing because it also impacts lives in a really significant way. But, but ultimately, you know, charity is wonderful, but ultimately I want to see sustainable development. So I want to see sustainable economic models, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and people like that, people doing startups to have that mindset of, yeah, I can just do my own business, but ultimately why not build a community? Because often a, a, an entrepreneur is like, I need this thing, but it's really because I want to do this other thing, you know? So I build these three or four little businesses to support my really big, hairy, audacious goal that I want to do. And so I would like to see just, you know, founders thinking differently, saying, I'm not just going to build my own little tower where I get to be king, mm -hmm. but instead I'm going to build this community and it's going to live on beyond me. And then I'm going to do something else. I, I absolutely love hearing that because I mean, even you know, just, just seeing my own thought patterns and, and the, you know, I don't, as an entrepreneur, I love, you know, building, I, I don't think about building the next Uber or the next Microsoft. I think about building, you know, uh, just a, a conglomerate of small things to try to help my community or the people who I see eye to eye with uh, mm -hmm. connect with. Um, and, but with the bigger vision of building a DAC of some sort. So the Liberty minded build freedom people in the world have a, a means to like get together and make decisions and have our money and, you know, work Sign me up, Ash, let's do yeah, it. Dude, I'm telling <laughs> that's, you, that, awesome. that's, that's it, man. That's it. It's like, it allow it gives so much freedom to small entrepreneurs. I'm not the smartest guy in the world. I'm not Elon Musk. I don't know how to build spaceships, but I, I can build little, you know, value producing companies. And if you build enough of these small value producing companies all within like the same niche, the build freedom niche, for instance, then at some point that community is going to get so big that it, it wants to use itself it wants to communicate with itself and it needs organization you know it's like we build all these decentralized tools so that we can kind of have more but voluntary central uh communities like i can't have a community with people in africa and india and europe and south america and all these places we have no way to centralize ourselves but we it's so interesting to me that we build these decentralization, these tools of decentralization so that we can find a new type of centralization that wasn't previously uh, being able to be built. I don't know. Does that make sense? Am I just talking jumble here, Luke? It makes sense because it's with the people that you choose to include. Right. Yeah, I, I look at it as, you can get as you're, you're, you're building a tribe. A tribe is a form of centralization. So you can right. <laughs> but it's a, it's a tribe that is not based on imaginary lines drawn on a map. It's not based on some, you know, where they were born. Yeah. It's based on, you know, shared desires and beliefs and, and uh, again, value propositions of what they believe is valuable. So I, I think that, yeah, that there's, you know, Dunbar's number and all this other stuff. There's a, there's a centralization that happens in our brains as we think about things. But ultimately, you know, the more transparent and voluntary and consistent it can be. One of the things I like about the way Michael's defined this, when we talk about DAX, that autonomous part is 
often confused. Like, so what does that mean? Is it AI? Does it like, what is that? Mm. And, 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 you know, you, you can talk about this more, Michael, but when you said it's basically just something that's reproducible, you know, it's, it's there on a chain in a smart contract and you put in inputs and you know what outputs you're going to get. And it's very consistent. It's, mm. it's reproducible. That, that autonomous nature to it is something that you just don't get in, in corporations that change their mind and governments that just change their mind. And all of a sudden people are like, wait, this isn't what I signed up for. You know, this isn't what I believe to be the case. You know, we actually have a mechanism for this is exactly what's going to happen. And if we do change it, we can know that we're changing it with the actual agreement, everyone who's participating. And there's a, like an auditable trail of every single decision that, that happened, which you don't get in the traditional world. And Ash, to get back to your question about like what, what could be built as a DAC, I like to almost think about it backwards, which is that, so, you know, any sort of for-profit thing that you could build that exists on chain. So for one of the examples we have right now in EOS are these gambling dApps, right? So if you build a, a for-profit business on chain, you can create a, a token that represents ownership of that business. And you can actually distribute those, those profits programmatically to your shareholders. And then you can give those shareholders governance rights and you can distribute a portion of profits to a treasury and give them governance rights over the treasury. Um, and so I think, you know, you, you, and you can have, um, you can have worker proposal system for, for people who want to contribute to active development and get paid by the treasury. Um, and I actually think you'll see all sorts of new models where like you could theoretically have different classes of shares where it's like, if you're, if you're launching something early on and you want to um, make sure that there's, uh, that governance is 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 something that's done with active participation. You could have a certain class of shares that, for the first you know two years, has more voting power than than general shares. Or you know, something I'm trying to do is like learn a little bit from the corporate governance world to think about how we could take stuff that has worked and and you know do it transparently and and fully decentralized. Um, but I think like anything that any business that exists fully on chain, like any crypto native business, could theoretically be operated as a DAC. They all should be operated as DAX. I don't oh, okay. see any reason why you would have a, a centralized DAP running on the chain. <clears throat> yeah, we've talked about this Trust. before. Yes, yeah, speak more to that, Michael. Keys. The private keys are I so mean, critical. Yeah, I mean, for, for trust and reliability and longevity, um, you, you need it to be a DAC. You need to, everything to be transparent that's happening within that company that you're putting your trust into. Um, quite often, you'll hold tokens. Um, and anyone can change the token contract and just remove your tokens anytime mm. on EOS. Um, but if it's controlled by a multi-signature of 12 elected custodians, it's it's a hell of a lot harder to, to change. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> As I said earlier, it's a technical challenge. Yeah. It's it's really important. And it's it's you know, I was thinking that this was just unique to EOS, you know, because we have the ability to modify contracts. But i I ran into it, you know, a few weeks back with Substratum. You know, it was a token that I own and I tried to transfer it. And I, I tried it three or four times and I kept getting all these errors. And I went and looked at their token contract and it was like a week worth of errors. And I'd go to their telegram and I learned, oh, by the way, they updated their address to their token contract. They locked that one down and now it's a new token contract. You know, so I wasted all this gas on Ethereum just trying to move a token right. So even on Ethereum, the community can get together and just be like, we're making changes. Mm -hmm. And without a model for that uh, in a way that is clear and transparent and there's a governance you know, system for how to make those changes, you just, it's just, you can't put significant amounts of value in that. And, and I, I, I really get concerned when I see these really valuable tokens that come out and they've got private keys. They really should have no private keys. They should have, right. as Michael was saying, a decentralized model of governance where all these individuals have you know, their own mechanism for multi-sig private keys on their own personal accounts. Mm -hmm. And then they all collectively you know, account for the permissions of the system. So like Shintai is an example. A lot of the block producers are, yeah. you know, we have to be called upon when they want to make changes because they've yeah. decentralized the governance of the smart contracts there. And, and I think that's, that's the model we want to follow. And for people who got confused about uh, this account shouldn't have keys, what, what Luke means is the, the account itself doesn't have its own set of keys, but instead of keys, it uh, designates other accounts that, that come in and sign on that account's behalf. Maybe it's two people, maybe it's three people, you know, maybe it's like Shintai, maybe it's a handful of people, but it's not that there aren't, it isn't a way for that account to uh, validate a transaction. It just doesn't have keys itself. So it literally can't be hacked because it doesn't even have keys. You would have to hack each 
enough of the multi-sig other accounts in order to sign a transaction on that behalf. And whenever I figured that out, that's when the whole chestnut idea really came through to me it was like, oh, an account doesn't even need to have keys. You can have wait periods. You can have other accounts designated. So yeah, that's, uh, people don't talk about that a lot, but I think it's, it's the fundamental structure that can really build business on top of because it, it truly keeps you safe. Unlike you know, Bitcoin, for instance, which, yeah, you can do multi-sig Bitcoin. I don't know why it's still so hard after 10 years and why nobody really talks about this. And here we're doing it in EOS, you know, six months later. I mean, just think about voting. If if literally everyone had their own key and to make a citywide or statewide or government-wide decision, everyone actually had to use their, their own key. And then the eventual multi-sig counted up to millions and millions of people. I mean, I see that as like an end game, which yeah. is really exciting, but we got to start here. We got to start small, you know, get the plumbing, which is, and, which is and, the abi- and the ability to designate other accounts on that account's behalf, or, I mean, and the, just the simple yet genius ability to have multiple pairs of keys to do different things. You know, I was learning, I can't remember if it was from you guys or if it was from EOS Canada, but I'm building a project where I want to create a, a, a key pair, a permission just for claiming dividends, for instance. And, you know, it, in Bitcoin, you, you would need to just put your, your private key in there. And how safe is that? So, yeah, anyways, a little rant there, but. Yeah, I think, no, I think we were talking about that in Denver. It's like we have we have all these specific keys yeah. for specific things, and you could program your smart contracts to say you need this specific permission that you've defined in order to call this function, yeah. and those can be completely unique to what you want. It's a little bit goofy. Like Michael and I have talked about this a, a number of times. Is that like you you can't access that data easily on chain? You'd have to like replay the chain to actually know exactly how those were all set up. But it's you know it's a it's a really powerful feature, and it's there right now. Yeah. I mean, and just think about from an entrepreneur, from a building business perspective, how much more freedom and flexibility that offers you to, to have key structures in that way, it, it, you know, for a DAG, for instance, or even not a DAG, just have a couple. Yeah, of we wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to run the DAG at all without the permission systems that we've got. It just, yeah. You could kind of emulate it on Ethereum, I guess, but you it's, not, it's, it's not like system gas. native on Ethereum. Some, no, no. So that's uh, why I mean, you'd have to write it as a, a DAP layer um, and it, it would just consume all of your gas and you'd have to yeah, got a lot of gas and more in gas. Yeah. Yeah. You have to uh, gas, up. <laughs> <laughs> gas up, gas out. Uh, fellas, we're running up right at an hour here. Is anything that we didn't cover anything anybody wants to just chat about? I, I, I guess the tools you guys have built or the can't wait to tell everybody oh i definitely want to say help these guys get to 15 percent because we want to see this experiment go because if the first one doesn't work the second one probably will and they'll probably be the guys doing the second one money back miles <laughs> i'm telling you yeah <laughs> yeah so yeah you- you've got eos stack tokens go to members.eostack.io definitely and then also too miles uh, has all of them yeah he needs some uh, eos stack swag i had at least something <laughs> yeah, yeah. T- t-shirts get it going <laughs> I would say too, just you know, as you're as you're joining this community and discussion, like definitely keep the you know critiques coming too. Like I want to know what you think isn't going to work, and I want to I want to continue refining this process because we're making it better and better as we go. Like read through our constitution, you know, poke holes in it. If we need, if we can improve, let's do it. Let's adapt and evolve. You know, so it's 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 an exciting experiment. Well, it, it is definitely exciting, and it's it's so obvious to me that this will be a thing in the future once we get these mm-hmm. fundamentals understood and get the tools built. Um, we're just we're, it it goes right along with build freedom. We're not trying to change the government. We are building the world that we want to live in, and we're building the tools to create the communities that have long lasting and value creating effects. And that's for me the most foundational and exciting part about DAX and DAOs or whatever you want to call them. Um, gentlemen, it's, it's been so much fun discussing this with you. I mean, man, this just ties right into the whole freedom line of thinking that I, I have committed myself to. So Luke, as always, buddy, you've got the best looking background in the joint. Uh, Michael, it's so nice to see you outside of Telegram. This is great. Welcome to your first time on ES Radio. It's good to um, stand in for Eve one day. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm very happy uh, you can yeah. have him back 
tweet. It, it's it's amazing how much you get invited yeah. on the show when you have a good microphone. Uh, my, my, Miles, I, I feel like I'm giving Eva a run for his money in terms of appearances. Yeah, on the show. yeah, yeah. Look, hey, we, look, we, Zane and I built this platform to uh, invite the people on who have great ideas and who can hold conversations. So. You know, and who give voter kickbacks to Ash Oro. Just kidding. Shirt, shirts, t-shirts, all, t-shirts, medium, sometimes large. Yeah. Sometimes. Yep. Depends on how much we're eating. Uh, hats, you know, if you're looking for votes, me and Zane love t-shirts. Uh, anyways, all right, Zane, I appreciate you, man, coming on again and help me host this. You know, Zane works very closely with Dexter. I'll give our virtual assistant, our content manager, Dexter, a shout out here. He, uh, he definitely helps us organize this stuff. So, Definitely. fellas, I, I, yeah, I hope you all have a great freaking week ahead. And until next time, everybody, this is Team EOS, and we're building freedom. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks for having us. No doubt. See you guys. Bye.